Hello and welcome to Lecture 57 of my class from Data to Decisions. I'm Chris Mack, your instructor, instructor for this class. And in this lecture, we'll talk about robust regression estimation. Like the previous two lectures on those topics, uh, this demonstration will be very brief. There's a lot to, involved in robust regression and robust estimation. There's a lot of interesting mathematical techniques that have been developed. A lot of difficulties that I'm simply not going to touch on. Instead, I'd like to just very briefly introduce you to some of the R techniques that people use for robust estimation and regression. Uh, one of the packages that has some good uh, tools is called Robust Base. I've installed that package. Now I'll load the library. And it has a data set called HBK. Now, HBK is a made up data set. H, B, and K, I think, are the initials of the authors of the book data comes from. So I will load the data from this database by using the data command. And then I can plot it, and we can take a look at what's there. So what we have here is a set of data. There are 77 data points. Most of the data points fall into a cluster. Um, but then we have a few other data points that seem to be contaminations. In fact, 14 data points. If you look here at this uh, how, how Y um, uh, correlates with X3, out of X3 versus Y, we see a cluster of, of data. That's most of it. I have four data points that seem to be extreme in X, but not extreme in Y. Right? Uh, so those are maybe high leverage points. But then I have another 10 data points which are extreme in X and extreme in Y. Right. What if I do a regression of y versus x3? What am I going to get? Well, ordinary least squares regression might give you some line that kind of splits the difference between these two. If I didn't have those 10 data points, I'd probably get a line that was that, that didn't go nearly as high in y as x goes large. And you have to wonder whether any of these data points come from the same distribution. Uh, and if they do, which ones? Right? Is, is this the right group of 10, or is this the right group of 4 to show uh, the extension? If I were designing experiments and trying to, to figure this out, I'd simply try to make my x3 variable go through a range in between so I could see. Um, but I think there's very little doubt that there's some contamination going on here. We just don't know which data points are contaminating. So how can we... Uh, do the modeling. We can just do ordinary least squares regression. The summary, we, we get a bunch of parameters, uh, confidence intervals around those parameters. But does it tell us if, if some of these data points are contamination? That is, uh, data that comes from different probability distributions. Well, if we want to do some estimation, first thing I'm going to do is take my HBK data here, which has x1, x2, and 3. Uh, regressor variables and y, the response that I'm trying to measure, I'll, I'll just take the first three columns of it and ignore the response, and I'll call that hbk.x, my x variables. And then I'll ask, what are some measures of location and scale for each of these x variables? Well, I'll, I'll load the library mass, which has some of the routines I'm going to use. And then thinking about measurements of location, what could we do? Well, we could calculate the mean. There it is. It's 3.2. Now, this is the mean of x1, first of the three x variables. I could look at the median. It's 1.8. Well, there's a huge difference between the mean and the median. Uh, in fact, the data is all positive. There are no values less than 0 uh, or about 0. So uh, that's a fairly significant change in our location estimation. I could use a 20% trimmed mean, and I get 1.9. I specifically used a 20% trimmed mean, and, and uh, R uses the definition that it trims 20% off of both ends. Because I know that 14 of these data points are, are quite a bit different than the rest. So if I only trimmed 10% uh, off, I wouldn't be trimming all 14 of those data points. Um, there's a couple of other techniques that have been developed. Uh, there's, for example, um, covariance, uh, robust covariance matrix calculations that use a number of techniques, one of which uh, is called 
median uh, covariance determinant, MCD. I think that's what it is. I'm not an expert at it, uh, but uh, there are a couple of different routines, one of these from the Mass Library, uh, that make those calculations of central tendency, and I get numbers like 1.5. Uh, so each of these, none of these are, are right. That's an important point to make here. You can't look at one of these and say, oh, this is the correct measure of central tendency. The correct value of the mean just means you didn't do the math wrong. The correct value of the median just means you didn't do the math wrong. They tell you different things. They explain things differently. So uh, what information you're trying to get out from your data is different measures boil the, the data down to a single location parameter differently. One is not right and the other wrong. They just are different. So you have to interpret them in the proper way. Measurements of scale. Obviously, we have the standard deviation as our normal measure of spread or scale in the data. Here I see 3.65 as my value. If I use the MAD, absolute deviation from the median, the number I get is 1.92. So it's quite a bit different. Uh, likewise, I can use this multiple of the IQR. 7413 times the IQR gives us a number which if I had a normal distribution would produce the same value as the standard deviation. That's what the constant is from. And you see I get an IQR-based measurement of scale of 1.67. Uh, the covariance matrices also give us uh, uh, variance estimates. So if I take the square root of the variance estimates, which are the diagonals of the covariance matrix, I can get measures of those scales, and they're like 1 and 1.2. So each of these measurements produces different things. Um, let's take an example uh, that we've looked at many times before and look at the difference between removing an outlier and using robust regression because that's our main goal in robust regression is to say well i don't want to be bothered with the idea of doing outlier rejection at each individual data point deciding if it's an outlier deciding whether to throw it out or leave it in or winsorize it i'm just going to use robust regression and not worry about it well we can make some comparisons so i'm going to load up this uh, body fat data set might recall uh, from way back in other demonstrations that it has one data point that we would label as an outlier. So if I were to do a very simple model of body fat versus one vector variable, abdomen, I get a specific model. And I'm going to focus just on the coefficient multiplying abdomen. That is the slope. It's 0.633. If I were to perform that same regression using robust regression, there's one technique, RLM, Robust Linear Modeling. Uh, this particular uh, robust linear modeling uses a uh, Huber M estimator. If I were to run that model and look at the summary, I find that my abdomen slope has changed to 0 0.66, 0 0.658 instead of 0 0.633. Right? So the slope has changed uh, by using this robust estimator. Alternately, I've created a, a data set in the body fat that I've removed. I've already removed that one outlier. So I call it reduced. Uh, it, it has fewer variables, but also has that one outlier removed. So if I load that data set and run a standard linear regression, same as before, I find that I get a slope of 0.67. So linear modeling. With the outlier, give me a slope of 0.63. Linear modeling with the outlier thrown out gives me a slope of 0.67. And robust regression, I didn't throw out, I just kind of de-weighted that outlier using the M estimator. I got a slope of 0.65, something in between. That's exactly what we would expect. It, it not quite the same as throwing out the bad data point, the outlier data point, whether it's bad or not is a matter of interpretation. Um, but does de-emphasize and doesn't let that outlier influence the regression nearly as much, and so I get an intermediate result. 
Well, I won't go through it here, but there's, in fact, uh, uh, multiple re robust regression routines. I just used RLM from the MASS library, but there's also LM Rob from the robust base library, and there's a different LM Rob with a capital R from the robust library, and they all do things a little bit differently and they all give slightly different results. Um, I'll, I'll let, uh, uh, let you try out different versions of robust regression in a set of interest to you at your leisure using this script, which you can find on the course website. Thanks for listening.